thank you for our space in this building right now. God, we just ask you to come overwhelm us with your presence. Are you glad to be here today? Do you have an expectation in your heart? God's gonna speak to us today. Hallelujah. I feel his spirit. Do you feel him today? Do you feel him today? Hallelujah.
presence of God moving in your spirit, in your feet, in your hands. Somebody shout hallelujah. Turn to two or three people say, it's all over me, all over me. We're going to teach you this song we wrote a little while ago. It's called Over Me. the Lord on oh my soul with everything and with all that is within me for he has done great things I give to my God and King all that's within me can you sing that with me come on bless the Lord say bless the Lord on oh my soul with everything and with all that is within me oh yes say. for he has done for he has done great things Give to my God and King all that's within me. Come on, see the verse. He's a way, but he's a way maker. He's a game changer. The impossible is made possible in Jesus' name. He's my provider. He's Jehovah Jireh. And when the enemy comes after me, I will go. Bless the Lord, say bless the Lord on my soul. With everything and with all that is within me. Listen, Lord, oh my soul, for He has done great things. For he has done great things. I give to my God and King all that's within me. Oh, He's a way maker. He's a way maker. Game changer. He's a game changer. The impossible, the impossible is made possible in Jesus. He's my provider. Jehovah Jireh. Enemy comes after me, I will proclaim Hallelujah. I have the victory. Hallelujah. Listen, over my hand, I made no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more sadness. Over me, no more weakness, no more darkness, no more harness. Over me. Only goodness, only gladness, only greatness over me. Only freedom, only Jesus, only His love. Oh, bless the Lord for my soul. With everything and with all that is within me. For He has done, for He has done great things. I give to my God and King all that's within me. Come on, sing it. He's the way maker. Here we go. For He's a way maker. He's a game to the impossible. The impossible is made possible. He is my provider. He's my provider. Jehovah Jireh. When the enemy, when the enemy comes after me, I will proclaim. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have the victory. Hallelujah. I have the victory. No more sorrow, no more sadness over me No more weakness, no more darkness, no more harness over me Only goodness, only gladness, only greatness over me Only freedom, only Jesus, only Here we go, here we go No more darkness, no more 
Come on, somebody say no more sickness. No more sadness. Only goodness. Only Jesus over me and my family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Touch two people and say God is good all the time. Come on. I was lost, I was bound, couldn't find solid ground. I was blind, couldn't see how you call me royalty. But in just three days you came and rescued me. Oh, by the power of your blood, I am loved and I am free. And who the sun sets free? Have changed my name. I am not the same. Jesus, I let me hear his hey. I am a child of God. You have changed my heart, took me from the dark, gave me a new start. I am a child of God. Oh, 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 Last night, I was found.
Somebody shout, I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I am so glad you chose to come to Times Square Church. It would not be the same without you. Would you just lift your hands to heaven? Listen to me. I'm 56, none of your business. You know what I'm saying? It took me a long time to figure out that God is for me and not against me. To fight him is futile. If you're one of those who are here to prove God wrong, can I just challenge you with this? Just be patient. Just ask God, Father, are you real? Show yourself to me in a way that I can understand. I'm around all these crazy worshiping people who are jumping around. Man, I'm so glad you chose to come to Times Square Church because we love you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being in the house of God. Father, we love you. And God, we're no stranger to what's going on around the world. We pray for the Middle East. We pray, God, for our country. We pray for godless countries, Father, that they would come to know the love that only you could give. Father, this world needs you. We need you in our homes. Our fathers, our mothers need you. Use us, God, in our set measure of rule where we are. Speak to our hearts. And Father, I thank you that it's within your privy to, look, to turn things around. Some things can only be done through you. So Father, we simply submit one more time to you. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Brother Kareem, help us, man. Praying God comes to turn this thing around. Yeah. God, turn it around. Please. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Calling on that name yes, yes. that changes everything. Yeah. God turn it around. Ah. God turn it around. God turn it around. Sing it. Cause all of my hope is in the name yes. of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's right. Cause breakthrough will come. The name of Jesus. I'm praying God comes and turns this thing around. Oh, God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. The Middle East, oh Lord, oh God. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Lift your voice. God, lift your voice and say, it's all of my hope. up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is up to something. Come on, please. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. He is healing. Saving someone. God is doing something God right is now. Something right he is moving, he is moving making a way for someone. Way for God is someone. doing something right God now. Is doing something yes, He is. Right now. Right now. He is moving mountains, moving making mountains. a way for someone. Oh, God is right now. He is moving mountains, mountains. Moving mountains. making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. Yes, He is. Come on, only believe it. Hallelujah. He is moving. Looking away for someone. away for someone. God is doing something. It's all of my heart.
name of Jesus. The name, the name of Jesus. All of my hope. For your people, Lord. For your people, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. For your people, Lord. God, turn it around. 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 Oh, God. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Hear the cry of your children, Lord. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. I turn it around. All of my hope, cause all of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Break the wheel, break the wheel, come. Come in the name, the name of Jesus. All of my hope, sing all, all of my hope. Thank you, Father, that even the smallest thing you're concerned with might be a wayward child who isn't living a life that he was raised or she was raised to live. It could be a spouse who walked out. You could be you're overwhelmed in this economy. I'm just praying God comes and turns this thing around. God, turn it around. We're calling on the name that changes everything. Shackled by your heavy burden, neath the load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me. Now I'm no longer the same. Oh, he touched me. Oh, yes, oh, he touched me. Oh, the joy that floods me. with me since I met this blessed Savior.
Give him the 
ángeles y santo se postran ante ti los ancianos ríen sus coronas a Cordero de Dios Eres digno de adorar Eres digno de adorar Todo fluye de ti Y todo es para ti Tú me Eres digno de adorar Eres digno Mostran ante ti los ancianos en sus coronas. time because you are worthy of it sing it church come on sing
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want us to pray a prayer just to get ready to go into a time of intercession right now. Yesterday I received a text that our partners in Israel asked us to pray because they were under attack. Shortly afterwards, the news was filled with the report that an unprecedented attack on the nation of Israel, that Iran sent a hundred missiles and drones in the middle of the night directly into Israel. I believe in the Bible, so I believe in these words. He who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Psalm 121 verse 4. And I believe God watched over that nation in the middle of the night. Thank God there were no casualties. Thank God. Times Square Church, from its foundation, has been a friend to Israel and supporter of the Jewish people and will continue to be. It has been the heart of our founder, David Wilkerson, and has been kept by Pastor Carter Conlon. And so shall we continue because it is a biblical stance. We will stand with Israel. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. We stand as friends of Zion and brothers with the nation of Israel. That will not change though protests happen around us. We stand for Israel because it is a biblical Stand. Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And then in Psalm 122, 6, it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Those that are watching around the country and around the world, those that are here in 51st and Broadway, I want you to listen to me. We will pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We also pray for revival in the Middle East. That's what we pray for. We are taking a biblical stand. And, and times like this, I'm just telling you, it's going to get harder and harder to stand for biblical principles. They say that this attack was the most public secret for the last seven days in the Middle East. Everybody knew it was coming. But I have this suspicion that God was putting prayer teams together around the world that would stand with that nation, that while they were telegraphing the drones that were coming in, it mobilized millions of intercessors around the world to stand in the gap. And so folks, today we're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're going to pray for revival in the Middle East. We're going to pray that God does a work. Would you join with me as we begin to pray? Father, thank you that we could take a stand, even when it's not popular. Because, Lord, it's not a matter of opinion or my truth. It's biblical truth is what we want, Lord God. And so, Father, we are praying for your people. We are praying for that nation. We're praying for Israel right now. But, God, we know that you have a love for this world and this globe. You love the Iranians. You love, the, uh, the, you love Iraq. You love Syria. You love, Lord God, Saudi Arabia. You, Lord, you love Damascus and Lebanon. You love... Lord God, all of these people. And so, Father, I'm asking right now that in the name of Jesus, let your Holy Spirit work a miracle right now. Father, send revival to the Middle East. Send revival to Israel right now. Father, I pray that any, any other missile attacks that they're talking about, I pray that every plan would be thwarted. And God, I pray that there would come a love to that Middle East, that, Father, people would love their enemies, and that, Father, there would be, it would be the beginnings of people calling upon God for miracles. So, Father, we stand. We stand with Israel. We stand for revival in the Middle East. We stand, O oh God, that you would do a work. I pray that you would even put restraint, Lord God, that, Father, you'd give wisdom, Father, to leadership over there. So, God, we begin to, to believe, Father, for that miracle. So God, as we take a stand that, that today, which is very much biblical, but very much unpopular, it doesn't matter to us, Lord God. It's, we will stand where you stand. You said those who will bless what I bless, that God will be blessed. And so we will do that, Lord God. And Father, we are believing 
that you are going to begin to protect your people. Even today, you will protect your people. You have, you have put a, Father, it's not an iron dome or allies that protect Israel. It is the hand of God that protects that nation. That's what protects that nation. So we thank you, Lord God, for what you have done. And we pray once again, peace for Jerusalem and revival in the Middle East. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen and amen. Now, just before Stan comes, um, he's going to give you announcements. Would you just turn to at least three or four people? Just say, I'm so happy to see you today. And then you may be seated. For those that are here in person, for those that are watching around New York City, around the country, and around the world. Let me just um, give a couple of announcements. I know Stan will be talking about Water Baptism Sunday and all that's happening. We just finished the first round. I'll let Stan take care of all that. It's been an exciting day. But let me tell you a couple things. First of all, um, which is exciting to me. Um, thank you for your continual support. Um, last year we launched and we are seeing God do a work all over the world. We have a vision for a billion souls to come to Christ. That's what our vision is. I mean, we make, while people have elaborate visions, we want a billion people coming to Christ. So last year we launched TSC Espanol, TSC uh, Hindi, TSC Arabic, and TSC Chinese. Today we have just launched TSC Mandarin that's going into China and beginning to touch the people. Ready to go, ready to go is TSC Portuguese, TSC French, TSC Bengali and TSC Russian that is getting ready to go just around the world. So thank you for your continual support. It's just, it's something that God is opening up the door for, but what a great blessing. Stan Juke, who leads uh, all of our next gen high school, college, he gives oversight to all that. Gio, who runs the high school, is doing the water baptism. I told him in the, uh, I'm sending a message to him, I said, you better speed it up. Um, because there was 118 that got baptized just in the first one. There's another 100 to get baptized in the second round. So just, um, we, we'll, we'll give you all the information after that. Stan Juke, why don't you come, director of 212. Amen. Times Square Church, well, we want to welcome all of you that are here on 51st and Broadway here in New York City and all of you that are with us online. We are so glad that you've joined us to be in God's house today. For all of you that are online with us, we want to welcome you, we love you. Would you please right now at this time, would you type in the chat what part of the world that you are joining us from? What country that might be, what state that it would be? So if you could do that right now, we'd really appreciate it. We want to acknowledge you a little bit later in the service. For all of you that are here in the building with us, would you take out your phones right now and just make sure that they are on silent, on focus mode, and that we are not distracted later during the preaching of the word. We want to hear what God has to say to his people. For all of you that have your little one with you here in the service today in the building, if they begin to cry at any time during the service, we want to ask you please not to comfort them during the service, but take them to the lobby and our gold jacketed ushers we guide you to a room on the second floor where you can finish the service and your little ones can make the noise that they need. If you do have children here with you or have children that are not here with you, we want you to be aware that every Sunday for every service we have, we have a service going on simultaneously for our little ones on the third floor with our TSC Kids Ministry. That is a safe place, a wonderful team. So every single Sunday, students from, or, or children from six weeks old through fifth grade have something going on for them on the third floor. Our junior high students today, they're off for water baptism, but typically every Sunday they have something going on there. And also every Friday night, our high school, our, our young adults, we meet on Fridays in the Annex. So just invite uh, that uh, those folks, if you have anybody in your life who God wants to touch, invite them every single Friday night to join us at 7 o'clock. We also are aware that many of you might be brand new with us. For those of you that are with us online right now and all of you here in the building, 
we want to get connected with you. So for those of you that are online, we're going to put a link in the chat right now. We want you to fill out a digital connect card. We want to stay in touch with you, all of you here in the building. If you look on your armrest, there is a QR code. If you scan that with your phone, you will take you to that digital connect card. It'll just to give us a chance to, to make that first touch uh, point with you. If you need help with, with that, um, somebody can help you at the lobby in the... At the, at the information desk in the lobby. So we do have a few wonderful, amazing announcements for you. Men of God, are you in the house? Yes, you are. On May 4th at 9 a.m. to 12.30, we are having our men's gathering. Our men's gathering. So NFL's James Brown from the NFL today will be there to share his story and minister and to be a blessing to us. We want you all to be there. We want you to bring your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, and we do have some cards in the back for you to share with all those folks. Ladies, if you want to get somebody there, share a card with them as well. It is a free event, but you do have to get registered online at tsc.nyc forward slash events. And finally, Times Square Church, today is Water Baptism Sunday. Man, what a special time. It is a an amazing, amazing time. So we want you to be aware for many of you have already registered and are ready to get water baptized. Many of you are online, many of you here, but we are also opening up still registration until 1.30 today. You can get registered on tsc.myc forward slash events um, and we will keep that open until 1.30. Water baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision to go forward with Jesus. It's a step of obedience. So everything is provided for you. And if you moved, if you, even if you didn't plan to do that, you can today. It will be a wonderful, a most special time in your life to do that today. Praise God. Well, now, without any further ado, we want you to turn your attentions to the screen, Times Square Church. We're so grateful for your generosity, for your faithfulness. With tithes and offerings, we want to hear from our missionary partners in the nation of Colombia. God bless you. I came to Colombia for the first time 20 years ago. Uh, the Lord touched my heart and I had the instant desire to be here long term, but the doors weren't open. Uh, so I waited for 10 years. I did missions in Africa, did missions in the States, uh, served in ministry full time, but didn't actually come full time to Colombia until 2012. Um, I had the amazing opportunity to work with the City of Refuge, helping drug addicts, uh, prostitutes, homeless population, and during COVID, uh, the Lord specifically started to burden my heart for um, displaced women, Venezuelans, um, migrant populations of women and children that were on the city streets. As we know, when there's a calamity, when um, difficult situations come, uh, women and children are the most severely affected. So I just started praying and asking the Lord how to help. Um, and slowly but surely, the Lord transitioned me. So in December uh, of last year, I transitioned into a new season of ministry. I'm now in a different part of the city, uh, working to help migrant women and children, displaced women and children, giving them food, helping with housing, trying to help them with job opportunities, and just leading them to the feet of Jesus. Um, I have been now in Colombia for 12 years and wanted to take the opportunity just to say thank you Times Square Church has been a gift to me. Um, I'm also a single mom. Uh, it hasn't always been an easy journey, but God has been amazing and has been good. Um, and I wanted to thank Times Square Church, the pastors, the leaders, the elders, um, the congregants. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for loving on me. Thank you for 12 years of faithful support um, and for sowing into the ministry here in Colombia. God bless you. Everything that we're able to do to help people here in New York City and around the world is made possible because of your generosity. All of you are so generous towards the church and the kingdom, and we just want to say thank you. If you're prepared to give today, I wanna to remind you that there are five ways you can give here at TSC. You can text give TSC NYC to 77977. You can download the PushPay app and give that way. You can give online at tsc.nyc forward slash give. And the easiest way to give is by setting up a recurring gift on our website, like we're showing you right now. We've made it simple to give automatically from your credit card, debit card, or checking account. 
Life gets busy, and this is a great way to put God first in your finances. It takes less than two minutes to set up a recurring gift, and we've made it easy for you to give online through our secure platform. Or you can always mail your check or money order to our office. And if you're with us in person today, you can give by putting your tithes and offerings in the basket that our ushers will be passing out in a few moments. Thanks again for being such a generous church.
Come on, give God some thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad I know Jesus. Where will we be without him today? He loves us. He cares for us. He provides for us. He gave everything that he had for us. So today we celebrate that and we sing, Jesus, I love you because you care. Not because I've been so faithful And not because I've been so good You've always been there for me To provide my every need You were there when I was lonely You were there in all my pain Guiding my footsteps a shelter from the rain Lord, it was you That made my life complete You are to me my everything And that is why I see Jesus, I love you because you care, I couldn't imagine if you weren't there. Jesus, I love you. Because you care, I couldn't imagine if you weren't there. the joy of my salvation you're the peace in my song your loving arms they protect me they shelter me from harm you are alpha and omega the beginning and the end of you're my strong tower my dearest and my best friend Lord, it was you, you, you That made my life complete You are to me my everything That is why we sing Jesus, te amo Cuidas de mi no sé qué sería, no sé qué sería mi vida sin ti, mi vida sin ti. Jesús te amo, Jesús te amo. Cuidas de mí, cuidas de mí. No sé qué sería, no sé qué sería mi vida sin ti, mi vida sin ti. So we sing. Jesus, te amo, te amo. 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 Cuidas de mí, cuidas de mí. Jesus, te amo, te amo. 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 Jesus, te amo. Cuidas de mí, cuidas de mí. Oh, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. You've been so good to me, Lord. Jesus, I love you. I love you. When all my friends were gone, God, you've been there. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Lord, I thank you, Lord. Because you care. Oh, you're worthy of the praise, God. Jesus, I love you. I love you. You've been so good to me, Lord. Jesus, I love you. 
time and time again, Lord. Jesus, I love you. Oh. Jesus, I love you. Come on, anybody else love you? Say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Come on, say that. Jesus, I love you. Say it again if you mean it. Sing it. Jesus, I love you. Say it again. Jesus, I love you. One more time. Say, Jesus, I love you. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you, yes. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Come on, sing it. I love you, Jesus. I love you. I worship and adore you. I just want to tell you, Lord, I love you with all of my heart. Oh, come on, one more time. Let's all stand together. Hallelujah. Do you love Jesus today? Amen. Amen. What a blessing to be here together for what the Lord wants to do. What a joy to have every one of you here. We do want to welcome not only you here on 51st and Broadway, for those that are here with us live at Times Square Church, but we want to welcome those that are watching around the country and around the world and just say hello to all of you. I want to say hello. These are the nation's that are watching live with us right now. We welcome Tanzania and Uganda, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya from Africa, South Korea, Malaysia, India, the Philippines, and Guam is with us, New Zealand, Russia, and Ukraine. We're praying for an end to this war in Jesus' name. We also welcome Romania, the UK, France, Sweden, Finland, Germany, Hungary, Macedonia, the Netherlands, and Cyprus. We say hello to Canada, Venezuela, Argentina, Colombia, Peru, Guatemala, Haiti, Barbados, Trinidad, Jamaica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Puerto Rico. Can you welcome those that are watching? You know, our production team just said, hey, let's give a shout out to those that are watching live from around the United States. Would you just give me an opportunity? We're just w welcome all those that are not only watching around the world, but around the U.S. And so here are the states that are with us live, Nevada, New York, New Jersey. We welcome Georgia, Ohio, Maine, Connecticut, Florida, Alaska, Oregon, California, Washington, Vermont, Maryland, North Carolina. Pennsylvania, Illinois, Missouri, Michigan, Nebraska, Idaho, Indiana, and Kansas. Can you welcome all those that are watching from around the country? It is Water Baptism Sunday. We have some 118 baptized in the first service. I think we have about another 110 to baptize in this next one. About 230 people are going to be baptized today. 
That is from both in person and online. We want to just let you know, both in person and online, if you are a follower of Jesus and have never made that obedience step, which is always your second step, we always tell them across uh, at the annex where we're going to invite you to come and celebrate. That water doesn't change you at all. We don't bring that water in from Jerusalem or the Jordan. It is New York water. And how many know if you go in New York water, you need to be saved to get into that New York water. I do want to invite, uh, I know Stan talked about the men's gathering. I want you to pick up these cards for JB. I want you to invite all the men that you can to be part of it. If you're a woman that's here and you're next to a guy that you know, not that you want to know, that you know, that you know, listen, I, we already got caught, so that you know, would you look at him and just point at him and say, you're going to this. Just tell him that right now and just say, you're going to this. So you want to grab these, give this to your friends. Uh, JB in the NFL today um, has become a friend and God is using him in an industry that needs the gospel and doing an amazing job. Our series is called Because You Prayed. That's what our series is. Those are Bible words. These are the words that were said of the most powerful political figure of Israel, the king, King Hezekiah, when the nation was in trouble. A nation stood against it, and a prophet named Isaiah said, you have turned the tide of destruction against our nation. And then he says, because you prayed. And that may that be our legacy for our nation, your nation that's watching, and for your life and for your family. That's what can happen today. I believe this today. That because you prayed, someone's life could be rescued from hell today. I believe that. I really do. You know, there is an, there is an old, old chorus we used to sing in the church when I was growing up. I got to see how many old people are here today. And how, many, how, many, how many are old? Would you just raise your hand? Oh, this is, okay, about 30% of you. How many remember this song? I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. You know it. Come on, sing the second one. Satan had me bound. Come on. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Singing glory. One more, the third verse, the third verse. On my way to heaven. Come on, church. On my way to heaven, shouting victory. On my way to heaven. Now, before you go to heaven, you have a job that you have to do because I don't want you to go to heaven by yourself. There is an old 19th century preacher from England, an Anglican preacher named J.C. Ryle, and he said these words, the highest form of selfishness is a man content to go to heaven alone. I don't want to go alone. I want to bring as many people as we can with us, and I think that can happen today. Let's pray. Father, in these next few moments... Show us the power of prayer, that there is, and, and somehow let me describe the depths of sin, but the power of prayer today. That God, that can unhinge doors that have been locked shut and rescue men and women, sons and daughters, grandsons and granddaughters, nieces and nephews, roommates and spouses. Set people free today. Father, not just those that, that, that are living in bondage, but even us that have been wondering what do we do about people that we love that need a miracle. Today, let this be a day that, that begins a journey of victory that we're declaring we are not going to heaven alone. We're going to heaven with our families, with our friends, with our children, and shouting victory on the way to heaven. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen and amen. Give someone a handshake and you may be seated. Choir, you are dismissed. I love you, choir. God bless you. Thank you, worship team.
One of my favorite devotional writers, probably is known for his books on prayer, is a man named E.M. Bounds. E.M. Bounds wrote these words. He said, to talking to men about God is a good thing, but talking to God for men is a great thing. Talking to men about God is a good thing, but talking to God for men is a great thing. He's contrasting evangelism and intercession and really putting them together, but showing us how important it is to pray for people. And in our series, Because You Prayed, as we we're approaching the eighth message here, this may be the most important message of every one, of any of them that I've shared with you. I wanna to talk to you today, this is important, I'll explain what this means, is how to pray someone out of Sodom. How to pray someone out of Sodom. Sodom is the place of bondage, from the, so a place in the Old Testament. Sodom is the place of bondage that has its grip on a loved one for many years. In this story, the man in bondage, his name is Lot. And the man that will help get hell's grip off of him is a praying man and a man of faith named Abraham. He will be the man who will talk to God about Lot. How to pray someone out of Sodom is really learning this. This is what it's learning, what we're, what we're teaching you to do. It's praying for people that will not pray for themselves. That's what we're going to begin to discover today. Listen to these words from Genesis 19, 29. But God had listened to Abraham's request. This is the prayer. And kept Lot safe by removing and rescuing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities. And those cities are Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot's future, don't miss this church, Lot's future depended upon Abraham's Prayer life. Now that's weighty words, but I want you to hear that. Lot's future depended on Abraham's prayer life. Now here's my big question. I, I was challenged with this, so I'm going to challenge you today. Here it is. If someone's eternity depended on your prayer life, what kind of future would they be facing? Yeah, that's what I felt like. That person who said, woo, that's the, what I felt like. When I, when I heard that, I was going like, Lord, I'm, uh, please help me to pray. Think, think about it just for a moment about another person in Acts chapter 12. Does Peter get released from jail if the church doesn't pray for him? There's the story in Acts 12, 5. Listen to it. So Peter was kept in the prison. Here comes the key. But prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. And on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, what that means is execution was about to happen. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. I always pause there because if I know I'm about to die the next morning, I'm not sleeping soundly. How many are with me on that? But this is a piece that passes understanding. In fact, as I finish reading, the angels have to poke him to wake him up. That's not me. Look at this now. He was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, guards in front of the door watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell. He had to strike Peter's side to wake him up, saying, get up quickly. His chains fell off his hands. And then Peter watched doors open up supernaturally. This is incredible. I had a big debate when I was doing some graduate work. I had a big debate with a theology professor um, on this passage. This man knew the theology of prayer, but not the experience of prayer. And my point was, Peter would not have been released if the church didn't pray. And I said, why would the Bible make a point of putting in this passage of the church praying fervently and, and the angel coming if prayer didn't matter in this case? Because it seems that God connects Peter's chains falling off in his freedom with the church praying. That phrase, but prayer, is the turning point in the story. Listen to me for a moment. Never underestimate the power of a praying church. Never underestimate that. The great Puritan writer who I love so much, Thomas Watson, said this. The angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel out of heaven. That's what it was. Prayer and deliverance are connected. Your prayers and people's freedom, I think, are intertwined. Because we're not talking about getting simply people out of prison. 
we're talking about praying that the grips of Sodom and Gomorrah would be pried off of them and that they would be set free. Let me ask you this question. How many know someone that needs to be set free from a bondage, an addiction, an atheism, drugs, pride, a cult? There's so much. I've talked to, I was, I was even talking with some of the baptismal people that were up there, talking to one precious sister who is the only, from one of our connect groups, who's the only Christian. She comes from a, um, a whole family of Muslims. And so from, so to hear her story, she's standing, the only one in her family that's getting water baptized and is only a believer. And she just goes, this message today, it helped me to believe that God can get a hold of my family. See, church, when prayer is missing in the church, so are decisions for Christ. Churches that don't have a prayer meeting won't see decisions because prayerless churches try to amuse and entertain the lost where it doesn't have the power of conviction to drive them to the cross. They just want to get them to the show on Sundays. And folks, in these days and times, we need more than just a show. We need the power of God again to touch people's lives. That's what we need. Some of you are wondering if it really works and if prayer can really set people free. And that's the story of Abraham and Lot. It's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The name of that city, Sodom and Gomorrah, brings with it an air and a reputation of wickedness and evil. Let me say it to you this way. It was the worst place on the planet to live. If you lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was nothing to boast about. You were living in the worst place. And Abraham, the father of faith in this praying man, had a family member, a nephew named Lot that was living in Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me just give you a little bit of an overview because of, of how important this is to understand. In Genesis 13, Abraham and Lot separate ways. Lot chooses to go into Sodom and Gomorrah. That's Genesis 13, 10. Now, that happens, just bear with me for a second, because there is significance to it. It happens in the year 2085 BC, approximately. But you're gonna understand why this is significant. And the Bible says that after, it's interesting to me that it says that after they separated, that Lot went towards Sodom and Gomorrah, that the Bible says that after Lot had separated, God spoke to Abraham in verse 14. And I kept looking at that, and I'm thinking to myself, sometimes you've got to get the voice of other people out of your life to get the voice of God back into your life. And it wasn't until he never heard Abraham never heard about, I'm going to multiply you as the sands of the, of, the, of, of the earth and the stars in the heavens until he separated from Lot. And I started to realize that there are sometimes God has to remove people from your life so you can hear from God again. The story picks up again as we leave Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham has some incidences and some chapters in his life. Then the story picks up again with Abraham and Lot in Genesis 18 and 19. That's where our story begins. While Abraham is outside of his tent, three visitors show up. And one of those, two are angels, and one is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. The Bible is clear about that. It's the Lord, the, the angel of the Lord. That happens, it happens in the Old Testament. When, when Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fiery furnace and say, I don't see Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, but I see a fourth one who looks like the Son of God. That was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. These, heavenly, these three heavenly strangers show up to tell Abraham um, this news. He says that Sarah, your wife, is 90, you're 100, and get ready to start painting the room blue because you're going to be having a boy. So throw a shower. She's going to have a boy named Isaac. So to hear that as 90 and 100 years old, the Bible says that Sarah laughed. She was rebuked by that angel. But who knew, only God could have done it, that nine months later there'd be a little boy named Isaac that would come. And while they were leaving, it says in Genesis 18, 16, that Abraham was walking with them. And just before they were to walk out of sight, that third member of that trinity was going to go up into heaven and two were going to continue to walk to Sodom and Gomorrah. They turn around and they say, we cannot keep this a secret from Abraham. We need to tell him what we're getting ready to do. 
And the angel of the Lord looks at Abraham and says, we're on our way to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. Listen to these words. In Genesis, 19, Genesis 18, 20, the cries of the victims in Sodom and Gomorrah are deafening. And the sin of those cities is immense. They're going to destroy it. And I don't know what it is, but I think Abraham then all of a sudden realizes, I have a relative that's living there. I have a, I have a nephew that I've walked with and journeyed with. When this happens, it is now 2067 BC. Here's the significance. For 18 years, Lot has immersed himself in the culture of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot has been living there for almost two decades. And now Lot is about to be swept away with a destruction from heaven. He is not moving. He knows nothing of heaven's warning. And Lot is sitting with the Sodomites and has no idea Here's words that are associated with Sodom and Gomorrah. That fire and brimstone is on the way. That's where we get that phrase from. Genesis 19:24 It says that the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from out of heaven. Then my question just becomes this. As I'm reading this, how do you get a relative? How do you get a loved one? How do you get Lot, who's been immersed in this culture and this place for 20 years, that is about to be destroyed. How do you get someone that you love out of the grips of Sodom? How do you get them out of that? That's what the story is. That's where I think this becomes the most important message I've preached. How do you get a person out of a place that is holding them captive? That literally you see what they can't see. You see that if they stay any longer, that it is going to be catastrophic for them. And you who love them are trying to figure out how do I begin just to do this. I have to pause for a second because I want to make this really, I want to make this real to you, but I want to show you the difference of this. This isn't the first time Abraham sees his nephew Lot in captivity or captured. He is brought in as a, as a, prisoner, of, a prisoner of war, POW. People come into Sodom and Gomorrah and they take they take Lot out, and the Bible says in Genesis 14, this is an important point here. So just for a moment, I want you to get this. In Genesis 14, Lot is taken as a prisoner of war, and what Abraham does is he takes 318 men. For some reason, the Bible was clear that that's so many men it took, 318 men, and go and rescue Lot out of that. Then the story later for all you Bible scholars, Melchizedek shows up and all that, but that's another point. But I want you to get this. In order to rescue Lot at this moment, it just took a bunch of guys to go in, rescue him, and pull him out. This one is different. Why wouldn't Abraham then say, we'll get the same 318 guys in Genesis 19 and let's pull him out of Sodom? Because this is different. Listen to me, folks. You're not pulling him from a place, you're pulling him from a spirit. You're pulling him from bondage. And folks, there are moments, don't miss this, there are moments you can send them to 318 counselors, 318 programs, put them on 318 different prescriptions, but the only thing that can pry them loose is the power of God and a praying person. It's the only thing that can get them loose. And some of you have tried 318 of everything and nothing has set them free. This message is for you. It's the message of the power of prayer when it seems to have gripped people's lives. And it says that God listened to Abraham's request and kept Lot safe, removing him from the disaster. God listened to Abraham's request not to Lot's prayer, but to Abraham's prayer because Lot didn't pray. Lot's deliverance, listen to this, was through Abraham's relationship with God. Lot wasn't praying, but we can pray for those people even when they don't pray for themselves. My heart was, it brought both joy and laughter. I was reading the story of a Philadelphia pastor who told about the time that he was speaking at a Pentecostal college here in the Northeast what was interesting was he was a Baptist pastor. He, didn't, he believed in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but he's never experienced them before. And he said, so before the service, before he was going to preach to all these 
um, young people at this Pentecostal Bible college. He said eight men met him in the room, asked him to kneel down backstage so they could lay hands on his head to pray. He, Tony said, I, I'm glad to have prayer, but each of them prayed so long. And the longer they prayed, they kept pushing my head over. And he said, I felt like it was going to fall out. All these Pentecostals pushing on me. He says, and he said, even at times, it seemed that they started to wander in their prayer. He said, one guy started praying for some other guy and not me. Listen to what he said. He said, well, as they're all praying, some guy prayed, dear Lord. And now remember, Tony is the pastor that's supposed to preach. He goes, dear Lord, you know Charlie Stolfus. He lives in that silver trailer down the road one mile. You know the trailer, Lord, just down the road from the school on the right-hand side. And then Tony goes, I wanted to interrupt him and say, well, God knows where he lives. You should be praying for me. He says, what are you praying for him? He said, I got up tight. He said, and then the prayer went on. Lord, Charlie told me this morning that he was going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in and do something. Bring the family back together. Well, <laughs> Tony, had, Tony was just going, whatever. With that, the prayer time ended. They went to preach the college chapel. Things went well. And he got in his car to make the hour drive home. And as he began to drive home on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, Tony says he saw, saw a hitchhiker and felt compelled to pick him up. The visiting pastor said, we drove a few minutes. And I said, hi, my name is Pastor so-and-so. What's yours? He goes, my name is Charlie Stolfus. <laughs> Listen to this. He said, I couldn't believe it. He said, as soon as he told me that, I got off the turnpike, turned around and headed back towards the school. Charlie said, hey, mister, where are you taking me? I said, I'm taking you home. He said, his arrows, he said, his, he narrowed his eyes and asked, why? He said, because you just left your wife and three kids. He goes, he says, yeah, that's right. And then he said, he, he plastered himself against the driver's side because he didn't want to be close to me. And he goes, he said, as they're driving, he couldn't believe it. He goes, with that shock written all over his face, he, he then said, as he drove, I drove right to the silver trailer, one mile from the school, pulled up, and he goes, how did you know I lived here? He said, God told me. And he said, I totally believe God did through the guy that wasn't praying for me at the prayer meeting. He said, we got there, the trailer door opened up, his wife came out and says, you're back, you're back. He said, he walked up, whispered in her ear, and the more he talked with her, the bigger her eyes got, as they were both staring at me. Then I walked up, with, said with real authority, the two of you sit down. I'm going to talk to you too, and you're going to listen. And he goes, man, did they listen. That afternoon, I led two young people to Jesus Christ in a silver trailer. Get, get this. Don't miss this. It was the great J. Sidlow Baxter from Australia who said these words. He said, men may reject our appeals, refuse our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they're helpless against our prayers. Okay, listen. Get your phones out and take a picture. Tweet something good for once. Put that up there. Take a picture of that. Keep that up there. Men may reject our appeals, refuse our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. That's why for the next few moments, I want to talk to you about the depths of the sin of Sodom and the power of prayer. I want to talk to you how to pray someone out of Sodom, but I really want to show you the grip, you're going to have to see the grip on Lot for a few moments so you can see that if the pr a praying man can unhinge him from 20 years being in Sodom and Gomorrah, then God can do a work for my spouse, for my son, for my daughter. Lot is the one who must be prayed for. Abraham is the one who must pray. So let's talk about Lot for a second. What does a person who is stuck and in Sodom look like? What, it, what, it, what is it? And I want you to see the depths of what begins to happen. I want you to see the chains and the depths of deception in, in Sodom. Because if you can see the depth, you could see the power. Lot chooses Sodom in Genesis 13. And now he is a resident 
And this is what he looks like. Number one, Lot is sitting in the gates of Sodom. That's when the angels show up. They see him in Genesis 19.1 that Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. That's a big deal. To sit in the gate means that you're not just sitting at the entrance of the city. You are in government. You are in leadership. That's what that word means. All the decisions of a city were decided by the elders at the gates of the city, which means conviction has worn off Lot, and now his friends are now the people of Sodom. I want you to understand something. I'm just going to take a stab at this, and then I'm going to back off because it's probably deeper than I want to go into today. We have to be careful of distinguishing with people we work with, people we live next to, people we have coffee with. There is a difference between fellowship and ministry. The Bible says we don't, light cannot have fellowship with darkness, which means there's nothing in common. Folks, when I'm hanging out with unsaved people, I'm not going like, hey, we're bros. I'm thinking of ways to minister to them. I, but if I don't, then they influence me. Does this, does this make sense? I don't have time, but there is important. There's a difference between ministry and fellowship. Number two, Lot is not adverse to spiritual things. He's not an angry, he's not an angry spiritual man. I mean, not an angry man towards, towards things of heaven. Listen to this. Now the two angels came to Sodom that evening while he was sitting at the gate. And when Lot saw him, he rose to meet them, bowed down. He even invited them to his home. He doesn't curse out the angels or run away. He welcomes them. This person does not hate God, will even talk about church, will even come to church when it's convenient. But this convenience is, is not a compliment, but it's dangerous spirituality. Listen to me carefully, because some of you may be sitting in this place or listening online. This is a person that will come to church but never leave Sodom. They will welcome even a sermon but never leave Sodom. They are religious enough to talk about God but not religious enough to make a commitment to God. But folks, and here's the part I want you to get. Listen, listen. This is why we need praying churches today. This person, lots, the person that are in bondage, they don't need a church service. They need an encounter with God. They don't need another church service. They need an encounter with the living God. They can do church services and leave unscathed. They can leave church, they can leave this building and go back to living with their boyfriend because they get unscathed. That's the part that God has to pry our fingers off of. The third thing is that they've lost all authority when they speak about Bible or godly things. There's no authority. It's just words when they speak about it. Think about this for a moment. Lot is about to tell his children of judgment that's coming. And I want you to see what their reaction is. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law who are pledged to marry his daughters. And he said, hurry, get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But look at this. But his son's-in-law thought he was joking. There's no authority there. You can bring up Bible verses. You can talk about it. You can debate with me. But there's no authority. It's just knowledge. There's no conviction. His sons-in-law hear, hear him speak truth, but it seems to be joking. Fourthly, he has impaired judgment. This is the part that is just so full of deception. The Bible says that before they had gone to bed, all the men from any part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot and they said, where are the men, they, they didn't, those angels who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can rape them or have sex with them. And look what Lot says. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. That's good. But what comes next is, is unimaginable. He says, don't touch these men. But look, I have two daughters who've never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do whatever you like to them. Folks, come on. Look at the deception and the, and the degradation of this man's soul. And somehow he just says it with such ease. Don't touch the angels, but you can have my daughters. But don't do anything to these men, for they've come under the protection of my roof. All I kept thinking to myself is, is you're offering your daughters to be raped. 
where just a moment ago you're talking to angels and now you're, you're beginning to offer your daughters. And then I thought to myself, who has three daughters in my life? I kept thinking, did even his daughters hear that? Did his daughters hear what, his, what their own father said about them? And finally, Lot has no sense of impending danger. Look at the exchange between Lot and the angels when the, when the firestorm is starting from heaven. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. And then when he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and the two daughters and led them safely outside the city, for the Lord was merciful. Folks, I kept thinking to myself, how much more do you need to make the right decision here? You're, you, you have to be told by angels to hurry up. Then, then you're hesitating. they got to grab your hands of your entire... Like, how, how deep is this deception? And look, it even goes on further. As soon as they have brought them out, he said, flee for your lives. Don't look back. And we know that Lot's wife does. And don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, for you'll be swept away. And then look at Lot. But Lot says, no, my lords, please. I wanted to go, Lot, when, when does it register to you? They're shouting to him to flee. They have to grab his hands. And now Lot is arguing with angels. Incredible to me. A plane crashed into the mountains of Columbia some years ago. American Airlines flight 965 into the mountains killing all 151 passengers and the eight-man crew. It was returning to Columbia for the Christmas holidays, but it was during a storm. The weather hid the mountain, but the GPW, the ground proximity warning system, kept warning the pilots, terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up, pull up. And because they, they looked outside and they looked at their altitude and the flight recorder, they realized we've done this before, we know where we're at, we're okay, we can handle this even though there's a storm that's here. And when they looked and listened to the black box that they found in the mountains of the Columbia, the Columbia Hills, they heard the last three words that were spoken were this, shut up, gringo. It was the final words. Basically, we got this. I don't need to hear you. And 12 seconds later, it ran into the side of a mountain. The warning system saw what they didn't see and were too distracted to see. That's the prayer. That's the heart of Abraham going, I see what you don't see. Angels see what you don't see. Heaven sees what you don't see. And now the only thing is we don't need, we, conversations don't seem to work. Texting, emails, pleas, tears don't seem to work. And folks, the only thing that will work to unhinge a heart that is so, that is so, just, just it, it into the immersed into Sodom is a praying mom, a praying dad, a praying friend. And right before Abraham prays this prayer to get him out, because the Bible gives us the prayer that he prays. The angels, remember, they turn from Abraham. You're going to have a baby to Sarah and Abraham. Then turn, and then this, this powerful Interaction happens in Genesis 18, 22, as we talk about Abraham and close. The Bible says that the men were setting out for Sodom. I just love this, the way that the message says it. But Abraham stood in God's path, blocking his way and saying, I've got to ask you, I've got to pray. And, and no, folks, here's what I want you to get. What's about to come next from verses 23 through 33. I want you to get this. It's Abraham's prayer is the Bible's first recorded prayer. And without reading the whole thing, it's when he's talking to God and saying, if there's 50 righteous men, would you show mercy? If there's 40 righteous men, would you show mercy? If there's 30, would you show mercy? And he keeps, he keeps pleading with God not to destroy Sodom if he finds any righteous people. But I have to think that, he, that Abraham is thinking of one name amongst all the numbers that he gives to God. And that is his nephew, Lot. Let me finish with this. Let me talk to you about Abraham, the man who must pray. Because prayer is the only thing that can fight against the depths of sin and deception. 
I'm so thankful for our general overseer, Pastor Carter Conlin, and our team at Summit, our Bible school. In 40 degree weather and rain that still was hitting up in Connecticut, 300 people gathered last night at Yale University to pray that God would work a miracle there. Because folks, there's just certain times that it's not, it's not, listen, I studied apologetics. It's not, it's not coming up with another argument. It's not coming up with a reasonable argument. Some of these things need just people to pray, to seek the face of God. Listen, let me just fill in the blank and close. Listen to this. Abraham got up early that morning and hurried out to the place where he had stood in the Lord's presence. Don't miss that spot because he's talking about where he goes to pray, where he had stood. It, talk, it talks about a habit. It's a habit, a habit that he has. He looked out across the plain towards Sodom and Gomorrah, watched as columns of smoke rose from the cities like smoke from a furnace. And then the verse we read, but God listened to Abraham's request, kept Lot safe removing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities and the plain. Let me just say this as our musicians get ready to come. Abraham did not wait for smoke to pray. He didn't wait until things were going horrible. Oh, we better pray. He started praying way before Sodom and Gomorrah took place. I have to believe this was in 18 years of praying. I have to believe this was Abraham praying and praying that he went where, where he stood before. Where he stood implies he's been praying. And this is what I believe. Every morning, listen mom, listen dad, listen roommate, spouse. I, I, I see prayer like this. That as we pray, it's like taking a sledgehammer to hard hearts. And every morning we pray, it's like, and Cindy and I have a list of backsliders and people that we're praying that come to faith in Christ. And folks, there are some names on our list that have been there for years. But I have to believe this. As we pray for them every night, it's like a sledgehammer that comes every single time. You know what I see it as, folks? This is the image I see. It's like a man that's sitting on the, uh, that sees concrete and goes, we got to break this up because we're going to put down, we're going to pour new cement. And they're taking, I've watched it on the streets of New York. They're taking that sledgehammer. And what if it takes 35 strikes before, the, before it cracks. Was it the 35th that was the most important? No, they all count. Every one of them was loosening it up for that, for that crack to begin to take place. That's what I believe. I believe for 18 years, Abraham is going, oh God, get him out. Oh God, get him out. Oh God, get him out. And all of a sudden, when angels show up in Sodom, the crack came that day. God started to do something. Folks, let me tell you how it starts. Last week, one of our Connect Group leaders shared with our team that she and her husband have been inviting and praying for four years for a neighbor to attend church. What does that mean? That's the, that's the sledgehammer. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. And she said last Monday, she asked a group to pray, her Connect Group to pray on Tuesday. And they said she asked again, and again, and again, what she said was, she goes, I wanted to get some help in swinging the sledgehammer. And she said this, and they, they, she said, then they asked their neighbor to come to church. They said yes, and two Sundays ago, they got born again during the service, is what God did. When you mention a name, listen to me, I think when you get specific, you see answers clearer. When you go, God, save them. Just be specific. Folks, can we, can we do something here? Can we just, till now to the end of the year, how about we pray, we pick one person, and every day we just come. God, I'm back here again. Save them, save them, save them, save them, save them. Can we just, how many would say, I'm going to try to do this every day to the end of the year. I'm going to get sledgehammer prayers. I don't know. I just made that up. Sledgehammer prayers that just keep coming. God, that you're going to save them. Just, just one sentence. God, get them out of Sodom. God, save them this week. Always respond to that impulse to pray. What was amazing was when the smoke went up and he saw the smoke, he didn't mess them up. It didn't bring doubt. Abraham knew this. God's got this. God remembered Abraham and got him out of Sodom. We just pray, we let God figure out the rescue plan. 
God took the prayers of Abraham, sent an angel with a strong grip and a relentless voice and pulled him out of Sodom. A man that never thought about praying about himself. A man that was sinking deeper and deeper, sitting in a gate. Instead of ministry, he was involved with fellowship with Sodomites. And for 18 years, didn't realize that chains were going upon him. And we've got friends and family. We've got loved ones that maybe for some of you, they've been longer than 18 years involved with that. And prayer is our only recourse. It's to pray when they won't even pray for themselves. It's learning to pray someone out of Sodom. It's learning to realize that 318 people that Abraham used to rescue him the first time, it's going to take not 318 people, but just one woman of faith that's going to get on her knees and say every day, God, get them out. God, get them out. Prayer is not only our only recourse. Prayer is the only thing that can work. Let me finish with this as we close. I want to tell you this story. I'm reading a book that's just, um, that I took with me. We took, Cindy and I took three days off two weeks ago, right after Easter. And I'm reading, and I grabbed this book. I had no intentions of grabbing it. And two things happened to me. An excitement and an embarrassment happened both at the same time. An excitement happened. Have you ever read a book and going, this is what I was supposed to read. This is the book. And it, all of a sudden, it filled my spirit. But I'm embarrassed because it's a book I felt I should have read before. And I just, I just didn't. Many of you know that the story of this church is here. And the story is written. It all starts with a book called The Cross and the Switchblade. By David Wilkins. That's not the book I'm talking about. Because some of you are going like, your dad's in that book and you haven't. Okay, just let's all relax. Okay, I've read that book. Okay. Um, and let me just say something. How, how many, that, okay, this is not condemnation, but this is kind of, I'm excited to do, for us to do this. How many have never read The Cross and Switchblade? Would you just raise your hand? Hold it up high. You don't have to be embarrassed. Wow, same thing in the last service. Let me tell you what we're going to do this summer. We're going to take a Sunday night and show the movie, The Cross on the Switchblade, here. Is we're going to show it on the big screen. And I'm telling you, it, it's the book that I'm talking about that I didn't even, I, I knew it existed, but I forgot, is the book, it's called Beyond the Cross on the Switchblade. It's the next chapter of what God did through Dave and Gwen Wilkerson. It is so real, it's so raw of just the, 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 what Brother Dave went through after the miracles of Nikki Cruz getting saved. If you, don't, if you don't know the story, I have to just give you this one backstory. David Wilkerson, when he was in Pennsylvania, gave up his evenings, got rid of his TV, and gave up his, gave up his TV watching in the evening so he could pray. He had a Life magazine in front of him and saw on the front cover um, seven young men that beat up from a gang, the, dr the dragons that beat up Michael Farmer, a quadriplegic in the park. I couldn't remember if it was Central Park. Beat a kid up mercilessly, mercilessly, and were being tried for murder. And David Wilkerson saw that. He felt the Holy Spirit say, you have to go to New York. You have to go to New York and minister to these kids. He walked into the, the, into the courtroom. They wouldn't even let him get in. They brought him out and made a joke of him. And he said, what is that in your hand? He goes, well, it's a Bible. They said, hold it up. He holds up a Bible. They take a picture of him, and it's plastered all over the front page of the New York newspapers. All the gangs saw it, and they go, that guy's on our side. So they looked at the picture of David Wilkerson, this skinny preacher holding up a Bible, which opened up the doors for him to talk to all the gangs. Thus, Nikki Cruz, Israel, coming to Jesus, Teen Challenge starting, which has rescued tens of thousands of people from all over the world. There's over a thousand centers all over the world because of a man's obedience. But here's what's amazing. I'm reading the story of a struggle that David Wilkerson has, and I want to read it to you in regards to prayer. He said, in those years after I came to New York as what, as the, the papers called me, the skinny country preacher, he said, I was trying to reach the boys accused of murdering Michael Farmer. But there's one thing that puzzled me in all my prayers. I'd never been allowed to minister to the boys on trial. I said, why, Lord? Why did you have me come all the way to New York for all these boys and stop me when I was supposed to talk? He said, I asked God that question hundreds of times. I'm so grateful that God 
did the work with Nikki Cruz. I'm so grateful that God did the work for Teen Challenge. But he said, but I'm just wondering why? Why wouldn't you let me talk to the boys that were charged with murder? And he said, why, Lord, couldn't I not see the ringleader of it all? Kind of the Nikki Cruz of the gang, Juan Martinez. Juan Martinez. He said, of the seven boys brought to trial for beating Michael Farmer to death, three were released, four were given sentences from 20 years to life. I tried to get permission from the court to visit the jail boys, but I could not obtain where, what prison they were in, much less their home addresses to minister to their family. The name of one special boy, Juan Martinez, kept coming to my, my prayer time. I kept going, God, how do I see him? So David Wilkerson, now you have to remember, instead of choosing prayer, because this is where he talks about, this is, so, this is so good. He said, instead of praying, he said, I chose. Now you have to think about this. The boy he's trying to see in New York City is Juan Martinez. So he said, I thought this. I'll just go to the phone book and look up Juan Martinez. <laughs> Are you out of your mind? Martinez and Juan, New York City? Come on, Brother Dave. You, got, you can do better than that. This is what he said. It was so great when I read this. He goes, when I looked up all the Juan Martinez's in New York City, okay, this is going to be, this is a little dated. He goes this, he said, after I deposited my 40th dime, how many know it used to be a dime to make a phone call? Okay, just want to, how many remember using a dime to make a phone call? Okay, this is an older group. So this is, so makes, he says, 40 dimes are gone. He says, so I, and, and every time I call, Juan Martinez, they well, of course, Juan Martinez, but it's not the Juan from the trial. He said, then I did, here's the part I want you to hear. Then I did what I should have done in the first place. I bowed my head and prayed. I'm sitting in my car and I said, Lord, I give up. I've reached the limits of my own ideas. Lead me where I must go for I don't even know what to do next for this young man. He said, and then suddenly, incredibly, after that, the Lord said, stop your car and get out right now and ask for Juan Martinez. <laughs> David Wilkerson said he stops the car. He comes out. I don't, it didn't even say where he was. It must have been Brooklyn. He comes out and just goes, does anybody know Juan Martinez? And the people there go, he lives right here. He goes in meets the parents of the kid he's been trying to see. I, he said, I parked in front of the building where the Martinez family lived. Now, listen to this. This is how the story ends. I learned that Juan was in Elmira prison in upstate New York. I tried to make contact with him through the Martinez family. He even had permission at one time, but then they revoked the permission. At every turn, I was being blocked. I just said, well, God, maybe you don't want to, but I'm going to still pray. And still, he said this, after years had passed, years, I never let go of my wish to see Juan, but I would pray for him regularly. Then one day an invitation came from a prison. This time it was from Auburn State Correctional Institution in Auburn, New York. Their chaplain wrote that shortly after the appointment that he started passing out copies of the cross and the switchblade. The inmates, he said, accepted them. And he says they were so excited to read the book, The Cross on Switchblade. He said, that day, 150 inmates showed up. I preached a simple message. We sang a couple simple songs. I gave an invitation. And I asked the, the fellows who responded to meet me in the chaplain's office. Among the prisoners came was a studious-looking, heavy-set young man. He had a pleasant smile and a dimple on each side of his cheeks. And he said, Mr. Wilkerson, I've been waiting for years to meet you. I'm Juan Martinez. He said, I threw my arms around him and I said, Juan, I've been waiting to meet you too. Then he told me how he found a copy of the cross on a switchblade and how it meant a lot to him. He said, I got a favor to ask you, Mr. Wilkerson. Would you pray for me so I can change? He said, it had been my dream. I pulled Juan aside and I said, Juan, just repeat this prayer. It's really simple. Just tell Jesus you believe that he's the son of God, that you're a sinner, and you'd like to turn your life. I said, would you want to do that right now, Juan? He said, yes. He lowered his eyes, repeated the prayer. When he looked up, his eyes were gleaming. And he looked at Juan. Brother Dave said, it's the start of a new day, Juan. From now on, nothing else is going to be the same. Folks, that 
starts when you put the dimes back in your pocket and you get down on your knees and go, God, only you can make this work out. If you've got somebody that needs to be set free, a name that comes to your mind right now, stand to your feet right now, quickly. Just stand to your feet. If you're going, I got a name, they are in Sodom. They may be with you right now. Don't look at them. Just look straight ahead. Just look straight ahead. Because I got, I'll have a word for them in a second. But I want to bring that person who is stuck in Sodom before the throne of God. I want you to become Abraham. I want you to begin to choose to become Abraham from this point on that you said, I'm just going to come. I'm going to come every single day. I'm not going to wait for smoke. I'm not going to wait for smoke to rise. The moment I'm seeing a little shift of their love for God, of not wanting to be in the presence of God, that I'm going right to prayer. Some of you said the smoke is going, the fire is there, brimstone is coming, and I need a miracle. God can do it. God can work this out. God can work this out. The bondage could be atheism. The bondage could be deception. It could be drugs, a cult. It could be a sexual lifestyle that they've chosen. It could be any one of those things. But I have to tell you this. They may, they may, they may reject your appeals, refuse your phone calls, won't answer your texts, but they are helpless against your prayers. Only God can come in. Whether it's your Lot, your Juan, or your Charlie Stolfus, who knows who it is? You know the names, and you know who you're praying for. Can we begin to pray for them right now? Come on. I want to turn this place into just, this is going to become Abraham's prayer meeting right now. Come on, lift those hands right now as we start to pray for them. Father, I stand with them. I've got names that I've been praying for, Father, for literally years and years and years. And Father, I'm, I'm, I'm worried because some of them seem to go deeper and deeper into atheism, agnosticism. Some are going deeper and deeper, oh God, into addictions. But God, I have to believe that as we stand in the gap, you gave us this story of Abraham and Lot. 18 years in bondage. And you would rescue him right now, Lord God. So Father, I'm believing for a miracle. A miracle. These hands raised. Father, these represent tears and pain. It represents some of, some, some of them have sleepless nights. But oh God, we're going to believe for a miracle all over this place, all over, the, all over, Father, the world that have their hands raised in homes and in kitchens and in living rooms. Those are raising a hand right now as they're watching on a phone in an airport or in a subway. They're watching, oh God, or even listening right now in a car. We are praying for that son, daughter, granddaughter. We're praying for that friend, the roommate, the spouse. And we're saying to Sodom, we're saying to hell, let them go in Jesus' name. We're praying for the crack in the concrete. We're praying, send the angels. While Lot is sitting in the gate, some of them are sitting in a bar, sitting in a club, sitting on a boyfriend's couch, sitting, oh God, in, in their dorm room, sitting in a frat house. Set them free. Send angels right now. Send angels right now to set them free. Oh God, work it out right now. Now, folks, look at me as we close. Look at me for a moment. Can I just tell you the end of the story? You can read it for yourself. It's all found in 1 Peter chapter 2. Let me tell you the end of the story. Three times in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter somehow sees the end of Lot and calls him three times. You ready for this? Righteous Lot. How in the world can God do that? He's God. He can take... He can take a sodomite and make them righteous. A man sitting in the gate, he calls him. Listen, not my words. I'm, I'd be calling, I'm going like, that's, that's, you know, dumb lot, unwise lot, <laughs> messed up lot. And, but when God gets a hold of you, it could become righteous lot is what it can become. The story can be changed just like that. So here's how we're ending. Can I just tell you, some of you may be sitting here in the balcony, standing up here. Maybe you're all the way in the back of the balcony so no one knows you're here. Or in the back of the church. Maybe you wouldn't even come to church, but somehow you're watching online. You may be here today because you're the answer to somebody's prayer. You may be sitting in this place and you're going, and you're going, I'm coming only because they are. And all of a sudden, you don't even realize you're part of someone's four, five, seven year prayer. And now you're sitting here. And today... God can turn the chapter and change your life right now. He can just change you right now. Pastor, 
Pastor Tim, how could that happen? Folks, you've got praying people that are here. And right now, God can come and change you from the inside out. How does that happen? So I love the words that Jesus uses in John 3 about being born again. You know what that means? You get another chance. That's what born again is. Folks, you're looking at somebody. I know, I'm so God gives second chances. How many know about a second chance? How many know about a tenth chance? Anybody here a hundredth chance? Boy, more hands on that one than the other ones. You're going like, okay. God, get, God is the one who calls us back and gives us another chance, another chance. And that can happen today. You may be the answer to someone's prayer. And you're sitting here today and God can change you from the inside out. How does that happen, Pastor Tim? You first start and go, I'm a sinner. I can't do it. I'm broken on the inside. I can't fix myself. There's no way I can do it. It seems the more I'm getting fixed, the chains keep holding on. That's why God sent his son 2,000 years ago, admitting I'm a sinner, believing that God sent his son 2,000 years ago to die in my place so I can have a second chance. I don't get to heaven by my own good works. I get to heaven by the work of Christ on the cross. He, because of his work, it'd be foolish to say, think how foolish this is. Jesus comes and dies and says, do your best. And you're going like, my best, I'm still in bondage. I can't even do it. But by saying, God, I believe that you sent your son for me. And I want to make you Lord of my life. Let God change you from the inside out. He can change you right now, right now. If you're here today, listen, if you're here today, I want you to join all those that made the decision in the first service. If you're here today, I want to pray a prayer, just a born again prayer that says, God, I, please help me. I want out of this. I want, to see, I want to see a new life. If you're here today and say, Tim, I want, I want God to come in and change me from the inside out. I don't need religion. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I don't need Times Square Church. I need Jesus. Tim, when you pray that prayer, I'm a little nervous because I'm not perfect. Ooh, that's good news. Perfect people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. That's the good news. If you're here today and say, I said, Tim, would you, would you pray that born again prayer that gives me a new start? I need that today. You can keep your head, heads up, eyes open. There, she's already going right over there. If, you, if that's you, hold your hand up as high as you can. Say, put me in that prayer today. I want God to do that. Hold it up as high as you can. Yes, 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 yes. All the whole bunch of the middle rows, just all back there. Yes, 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 yes. All the way over there. Balcony, got you. That whole row right there. All the way in the back, got you. All of that. Folks, there has to be some like 40 hands that have gone up to say, God, come in and change. Can we pray this together? Come on. Let's say this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, now say this with me. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. All right, now listen. Okay, here are your instructions. In just about... Three sec, not three seconds. In one minute, Ricardo's going to come up and lead us in a song. What we're going to do now is if you're getting water baptized, you can leave now to beat the crowd. So start going over. There should be about a hundred of you. There's about another 20 online or 10 online. I don't know what it is. But let me say this. If you raised your hand and you're here today or online and going, I want to get water, ba water baptized, we've got everything over there. Towels, shorts. Um, what do you go? Well, what about my hair? Who cares? Just get over there. And we had a, we had a number of people who got saved in the first service. Just walk over to get water baptized. We got changing tents, slides, towels. And if you're here and go, I just got saved. There's one of those forty hands. Go over there and get water baptized. I'm gonna come over there in a second, do some teaching on it. It's gonna take five minutes, but you're gonna get water baptized. So just get out of your seat. If you're going like, man, I've never, and I've never been water baptized. I'm saved, but I want to make the decision. Get out of your seat and go now. 
After the song is done, I want you to come and join us over there. We have worship team over there. You're going to see people from, I think, India will be on the line. All these states. We had Wisconsin, Canada, Indiana, Texas, Georgia, Delaware. Oh, you're going to see all these states joining us to get water baptized online and in person. It's going to be absolutely exciting. So I'm going to ask you, take, don't just quickly go back and get your car. Go, take the moment. Rejoice with those that are getting water baptized today. Can we sing one song and then we're going to go ahead and go over to the annex. Let's sing one one song and then we're going to go. Before we leave, could you lift your hands and sing it one more time? Say. says that every good and perfect thing comes from you. Father, the good and the bad that we are, you're worthy, God, of all that we are. And what I believe is that's what you want. You just don't want us on a Sunday. You want us on a Monday and a Tuesday. You want all of us and not just part of us. So all across this building, we lift our hands. Come on, lift your hands. You're watching us online. You're at the Jersey campus. Wherever you are, just lift your hands. Father, we once again surrender all that we are to all of who you are. And we thank you, Father, that it's not just you, but we believe it's the arsenal of heaven that covers us, all that you encompass, your grace, your strength, your mercy, and your love. And Father, I bless this congregation of believers. I bless them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet that what they would touch would prosper to glorify your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, again, we thank you that it's you that flattens the mountains, that fills in the valleys, and that makes our crooked way straight. And God, this morning, may there be no misunderstanding to whom deserves all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said... Times Square Church, we love you. Have an amazing week. We'll be praying for you. Please join us for baptism up on the second floor, and we will see you on Tuesday night, if not next week. God bless you.